You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. I could see my life flashing in front of me. I was only 10, it didn't take long. Um, and it was in that moment that I knew I had to do something, other, otherwise I was going to die. It's peace in war. You know, people like Special Forces soldiers are trained to be at peace in war, and that's the natural environment they fit into. But I think I adopted that before I even got in there through the traumatic events in my life. The thing is, we're so driven by money and everything. Gr greed, I tell you what, forget COVID, forget anything. You know, the biggest virus on this planet is greed. You know what I mean? It's, it's, the, it's the cause of every war, it's the cause of everything. And really we're so money driven, we're so materialistic that we've lost the benefit of helping other people. We, even in a close knit team, people can't help each other. They're competing against everyone. The whole place was a mess and the sergeant got out and he's like, he'd been to Falklands. He was, probably done a few tours in Northern Ireland and he like there was smoke just crap everywhere you just like as a kid you're like fucking eyes are massive looking around and then he kicked something on the floor and it was like he says we've got to see if we can find any more of these fuckers and he looked down it was a head in the helmet and you're like fuck you know and that was like that was that that was almost like I'm not saying that's the most traumatic event in the world but for me at that time that was like a boy to a man in a fucking heartbeat there was flashes in the in the rear view mirror of a car coming up from the back Anyway, that turned into a full-on attack by the militia onto us. And I could smell, as, as we're shooting at these guys at 130 k's an hour, we had three cars in front of us with all our people in, you know, that we were protecting. And we're doing a fucking attack. We're being attacked by the militia at 130 k's an hour. I've got like a car down to my left. I'm driving the vehicle. I've got a machine gun on my fucking arm, blasting through my closed window at this car. I can sm and as I'm in this attack, I can smell the cordite from the bullets. Everything, the whole thing happens. We fucking, um, their car like crashes into the central reservation. We get out of there and I'm sitting there like the fucking wind's coming in the car because we've got no windows left. Ringing in our ears because they're all the fucking loud bangs. And I'm just sitting there thinking, what the fuck just happened? Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Ollie Ollerton. How are you, brother? I'm good, mate. Thanks for coming down. Yeah, thanks for coming on the show, brother. It's good to meet pleasure, you. Pleasure. Yeah. Offer, Special Forces, Who Dares Wins, Man of Many Talents. I've watched a few of your interviews as well. Very deep, very personal. A lot of trauma and pain. Yeah. But the things that you're doing now to work through it and push through it is, is next level stuff. That's the stuff I crave in life. And I think mm. a lot of people will get a lot out of this interview. Again, first of all, congratulations. Just got married as well. I did, mate, yeah. We beat the odds. Yeah. We beat the odds, came up to your homeland, mm -hmm. got married. And it was awesome, mate. It was, it was the best thing, you know, it's like the, the cliche, but is it, you know, the analogy that great things are created under pressure? I believe so. I think you, that's where your growth is. Yeah, when you're, it is. It's you the don't best know, things. Yeah. When there's no pressure on, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? You've got no... There's no sort of, there's no pressure to create anything. Yeah. But when there's a bit of pressure on, you, you come up with the best stuff. So happy then, married life. Yeah, no, it's great. It's great. Um, but I mean, it, it makes no massive difference. You know what I mean? It's like me and Laura were in no rush to get married. July was, last year was supposed to be when we were supposed to get married and it didn't happen. But the thing is, the way I am in life these days, if things don't happen, I know it's for a reason. You know what I mean? I don't sit there beating myself up going, oh, I wish, you know, I don't, if things don't happen, it's like the Channel 4 TV show, you know, I'm no longer part of the UK one. When that, when I got that phone call, I just, it was like, yeah, well, this is, that's, that's my journey. Yeah, you just know. absorb it. I mean, just absorb adapt it. Adapt and yeah, then move it's on. Just, it's not your time for whatever, or it's taking you to something else. Yeah. And that for us, not getting married in July, we're starting to get pressured of, you know, like who's going to come to the wedding and it was, it was starting to turn into this massive beast. And, um, you know, that then ended up being what we wanted. And that was a small affair where it was just me, Laura, and the dog. Yeah, at the end of the day, it's all about, it's about it's you about, two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fuck everybody yeah, else. No, yeah, exactly, <laughs> mate. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you end up, let's face it, you end up in a, a wedding, don't you? Yeah. Like, people invite people because they're in the family. It doesn't mean they like them. Mm -hmm. A lot of politics involved when it <laughs> comes to weddings. Mate. That's why there's so many fights, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah fair it. play, but, but I always go back to the start of my guest, brother. Where yeah. you grew up and how it all began. Yeah, well, I grew up in a place called Burton-on-Trent, which was a, uh, it's a brewery town. 
you know, pretty much all my family worked in the breweries, uh, apart from well, my dad didn't, but everyone in my family has uh, has worked in the brewery. So, um, you know, I was born there, but really I don't have a, because of traumatic event at 10, I don't have any memory prior to 10. So you kind of blocked it all out? Yeah, I think it's because it was so traumatic. It's like the rest is a blur beyond 10. It's almost like my life started at 10 years old. Yeah. And so, that trauma at 10 was you get a, you nearly get killed by a chimp? Yeah. How yeah. did that? How's that? <clears throat> about? Yeah, it's a good question, Burton on Trent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not in a jungle somewhere. It's mm-hmm. like... It was, um, the circus had turned up into, t- in, uh, uh, come into town that day. We were going out for, we just, actually we were going out for a swim. I was 10 years old, brother and his best mate. And then, you know, the, the circus had turned up just between sort of our house and the swimming bus. Circus had pulled up in town. So um, we were drawn to that, you know, I mean, kids for God's sake. And uh, straight away we asked, you know, can we have a look around? They were like, yeah, yeah, you know, help yourselves. There was no health and safety in 1980. And um, before I knew it, I was in the big top. And um, I kind of lost my brother and his best mate. And I was drawn to this gap in the side of the, the other side of this tent. And I went over to it, opened it. The, the sun hit me in the eyes, blurred, for, blurred my vision for a couple of minutes. And as it cleared, I saw something in front of me that was just out of this world. And that was a baby chimp. And I was in love with Tarzan. You know what I mean? I was brought up with Tarzan. I think I'd been watching it that day anyway. You know, I'd watched it every day, summer holidays. And in front of me, that was like, that was like a woman seeing George Clooney naked. <laughs> it was my little piece of Hollywood. You know what I mean? It was Cheetah. Cheetah was there and I was like drawn to this creature. And I went over and, and I, before I knew it, I stood over it, looked down and this little creature then looked up at me, beautiful brown eyes. And uh, it sounds weird, but it was, we connected. And... Um, and then it started picking food off the floor. So it's passing this food up to me. And I was thought, fuck it, I'm not I mean, that's disgusting. So I was like chucking it over my shoulder. And then uh, it seemed like a lifetime that was going on. And then all of a sudden, that serenity of that moment was, was, was broken like a fighter jet cutting through the skies. I heard this roar and I looked in the background. We were in this in, sort of in open area, but it was enclosed with trucks and stuff like that. And there was movement in the shadows. And the shadows very quickly turned from shadows into what was clearly mummy or daddy. It was about 50, 50, 60 kilograms. I didn't get a fucking chance to weigh it, but it was, <laughs> it was fucking big. You know what I mean? <laughs> Stop what I'm saying, let me weigh it. Let me just weigh you before you attack me. <laughs> um, and this thing's coming at me, Mac 10, and I'm thinking, fuck, I'm like a deer in the headlights. You know what I mean? I'm like, you know, I was brought up with cats and dogs. This is a roaring fucking grown chimp coming at me, Mac 10. It's going mental. And then this thing, just at the point, I'm thinking I need to get out of the way, make a run for it. This thing pounces through the air. And it was almost like the blue sky turned to black as this thing landed on my chest, pinned me to the floor, and it's just going fucking mental. The first fist came down, knocked all the wind out of me, second fist, third fist, and the next thing is teeth started coming into me, like biting away. And I can remember looking up at this chimp sat on my chest. That there was blood, you know, in its teeth. It wasn't, wasn't um, the chimp's blood, it was my blood. And uh, I thought... I could see my life flashing in front of me. I was only 10, it didn't take long. Um, and it was in that moment that I knew I had to do something, other, otherwise I was going to die. And it was, it was in that moment that fight or flight, and, um, or freeze, and uh, I managed to dislodge the chimp slightly, and I got a knee up to my chest and managed to kick the thing off me. And then uh, that gave me a few seconds and I managed to scurry out of there. And then the chimp got to its feet and it came at me, Mac 10, for the final attack. And honestly, it was like, the, you know, like you see in the films, it was like that far away from me and the chain caught it. And uh, in that moment, the whole place erupted. But for me, and that's why I talk about that moment so much, because there's a few things in that. You know, first of all, childhood trauma is the worst, you know, one of the worst traumas you can have. Um, secondly, that was my first break point, and that's the reason you sat here. This is the Breakpoint Academy. You've got the chimp to thank, <laughs> and that's where the first book's about Breakpoint. Yeah, the, well, the, the 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 first book is about Breakpoint. It's about the theory of Breakpoint. The theory of Breakpoint is the that to achieve anything in life, you have to take short term dis- short term discomfort for long term gain. For me, on that day, short term discomfort was taking a fight to a chimp, and the long term gain was me living. And that's the thing, when I use that as an, an analogy for life, we're wired to take short-term comfort, whether it's drink, drugs, 
relationships, work, everything, we're wired to take the shortcut. But that leads to long-term pain. The more shortcuts we take and the more certain, you know, easy comforts we take, it leads to a life of pretty much next to nothing. And you have to know that to change anything to, in life, to, ach to achieve anything, then you must cross that bridge of short-term discomfort. And you have to have that link to a goal. And there's a whole process. But that was my first break point. And also the fact it taught me at a young age that regardless of your situation, you have choices. Mm -hmm. Before that experience, till then after it, is this is what shaped you your whole life? Did you become more insecure, paranoid, angry, or did you become more into your shell? No, mate. I, did it change you the completely? first? You know, I was angry. I was I was a troubled little kid. After that, you know, it, was, it set me on a path of destruction. It's like hindsight's a wonderful thing, but it never won any wars. You know what I mean? We can sit back and reflect now, but then, you know, and you don't know at the time because when you have intimate, tra when you have trauma like that, you lock away that intimate trauma. It's like a survival technique, in inner survival technique to get you through the short term. So you lock away the intimate trauma, but that, that intimate trauma needs to be dealt with at some point. If you don't deal with it, it, it sticks with you for the rest of your life. And for me, looking back, I then understand that that, that, um, that really did change the path of my life. And I was, a, I was an angry little kid, got into a lot of trouble with the police, ended up on remand at one point, and that was a turning point for me. That was like, you know, and I thought everyone was like, he's going to end up in prison for the rest of his life. So people were kind of labelling you then that yeah, you were a loose yeah, cannon. Exactly. And Just this what? was the first, it wouldn't be, you know, I'd end up inside for the rest yeah. of my life. And that was the point as well where my mum, bless her, she, her life was falling apart. My dad had left financial, she was in financial ruin because of that. And she had three kids to bring up. And at that, at that moment, she knew how much I needed. And she bought, you know, she, she focused all her attention on me. And she concentrated all that energy and pushed me into like on my, um, you know, my cross country running, all my, you know, exercise, everything. And, and then at that point as well, 14 years old, my passion to join the military. So you <clears throat> made a decision at such a young age that you wanted to kind of, do you think joining the military at such a young age, what age were you 18? Were you doing mm -hmm. it because you were getting fitter, stronger, you wanted to learn, or were you doing it to kind of run away from the place you were at? I think there's a mixture of things there. And I know a lot of people joining the military, they, they are joining the military because they're running from something. You know, they want that brotherhood, they want that family. There's a lot of kids that come from broken homes. But really for me, I didn't realise at the time, again, looking back, but at that time, I was, I just wanted to be, in, I, I wanted to be at war every day. At that time, looking back now, I understand, but the war wasn't external, the war was internal. You know I mean, the war was inside me. You. So regardless of where I looked, I would not resolve it until I started looking within. But for me at that age, that took me on that path of self-destruction. You know, and, and, and for me at 14, it was like that going to war was like the be all and end all. That would be the answer to all my dreams. It would be everything. Is that because you had chaos in your mind? You thought being in, yeah. involved in it chaos answer, externally, yeah. you would find your answers? You know what, being in the Special Forces and, and being in, in the military as well, but more so in the Special Forces, is the fact that you don't actually start working until chaos starts raining. And that's when you, that's when you fall into, your com into, into comfort. You know, the worse it gets, it gets, the more comfortable you're trained to be. You know what I mean? So when it's not chaos, that's when you feel like a fish out of water. You, you know what I mean? It's like you, I, I, I call it, I've mentioned it in my books, it's peace in war. You know, people like special forces soldiers are trained to be at peace in war and that's the natural environment they fit into but I think I adopted that before I even got in there through the traumatic events in my life I mean it wasn't just the monkey you know after, after the monkey you know I got run over twice by a car I was always I was just in this shit all the time you know whether it's me get myself into dangerous situations, police, everything. It was just pushing and pushing and pushing. I was that about self harming as well? Just maybe I scream out for attention. Yeah. Scream out for help. That. Yeah. You were obviously you don't know back then. No, exactly. To deal with trauma yeah. and pain and inner child, we don't know. Yeah. There's so much now that people are searching. Mm. You can search. Yeah. And find some certain answers, but you know yourself, mm. consistency is key to all this yeah. game, man. And to change the neural pathways, to change mm. the way you think, yeah. and change the way you feel, it's still a fucking struggle. Yeah, it ain't easy, and yeah. do you know what I mean. No matter how far you've done in life, and everybody, mm. you're, you've got three successful books, successful yeah. show, amazing career. But every day, I bet you still have to push yourself to get up and survive. 
Yeah, I do. You know, people, th people think it's easy. First of all, though, the last seven years have been the best seven years of my life. And everything before that was a fucking major struggle. You know what I mean? It was a brave face, putting on a brave face. And, you know, the out, from the outside looking in, I mean, it's, I tell you what, it's my mum read my first book, Breakpoint, and she's like, I had no idea. It's like, they're the closest people to you. They have no idea. And you, you think, yeah, you, you've, you've kept a brave face all the way through. But it was a fight. But even still, you know, it's like still having a business. It's like everyone thinks that, oh, ex-Special Forces soldier, they love, they find this shit easy. You know, whether, whether it's getting, getting up early in the morning at five o'clock in the morning to go out for... I don't, I don't find it easy. I'm, I'm, and another thing is people think that, oh, well, you're like special forces. You cut from a different cloth. That's the load of bollocks. We bleed and breathe just like everyone else. You know what I mean? We're no different to anyone else. It's just that we've found ourselves in, ourselves in extraordinary, extra, extraordinary situations. So really, it's, it's not a case of that. I struggle every morning. It's, and that's why my second book was called Battle Ready, because every day is a battle. It's not about being in a war zone. It's yeah. about every day is a battle to be the best version of yourself. Yeah, we'll plug your books just now. So we've got Breakpoint, we've got Battle Ready, and this is the latest one, Scar Tissue. Yeah, Scar Tissue. So, so this is the biography. That's a, that really laid the foundation of who I am, the journey and everything mm -hmm. starting at 10. Um, this was when I came back. 2011 is when my pressure cooker exploded. So I fucking, my life started to fall apart big time. And that is really the, the process that I put in play. That's, that's the, um, the processes, the disciplines, everything I put into place to change or, and get to where I am today. And then the third book, Scar Tissue, is my first, first step into the, the fiction waters. Uh, but the thing is, I was, I was uh, when, when they said, you know, when we talked... Well, I talked to the publisher, my publisher, about doing fiction. I was like, I don't want to do fiction. I want to do everything self development. I want everyone, you know, my journey. I want to help other mm -hmm. people. And they said, they said, well, what about doing the same thing but in fiction? I was like, what do you mean? He said, well, the best platform for trying to inspire people and motivate people is storytelling. You know, it's ages. It's, yeah. eight, it's an age old mm -hmm. method of of getting that message across. So I realised. Although it's fiction, it, it follows the story of my life and it follows, you know, the emotional trauma that I was going through while having to deal with a very real situation. And, you know, that book is, is very much the DNA and the blueprint of who I am anyway. Yeah. So. Writing your books and putting everything on the line, do you find that therapy for you? Yeah, I do. But the thing is, for me as well, you know, when I said to the, before about cutting, you, you guys are cut from a different cloth. If you don't... Make pe if you don't allow people to relate to you, the content can't be absorbed. You know what I mean? Unless they can relate to you. And it's very important for me, for my own sort of therapy, and also to know that that is really helping other people, is to, to be an open book. You know what I mean? And actually explain and show people that you're just the same as them. You yeah. know what I mean? Until you do that, you, your audience can't relate, and it, you're just some, you know, someone that they could never be or, you know, you, you're a very different kind of person. So mm -hmm. it's important for me that, you know, I have been more than honest in these books, 100% honest, 100% honest with the fact that I didn't really particularly enjoy being a Special Forces soldier. Everyone sees, oh, he's an ex-Special Forces soldier, he's been on TV. They don't understand that there's a massive gap between those two points, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and, and really the fact that I didn't find my purpose until... A long time after, till about 2011, I didn't find my purpose in life. Yeah, and that—that's, you know, when I look back now, it's like I couldn't understand when I was in the military. When everything I did, when, when from an early age, I was never happy, never happy. That's why I was bouncing all over the place trying to find this external fix that was going to make me happy, make me fulfilled, and it wasn't out there. It wasn't until I started looking inwards. But that was only when I stumbled across something when I went to Southeast Asia and rescued kids from prostitution and slavery that was the one thing that changed my life forever yeah. you know, see the world differently yeah no it's just it was the fact that I'd f for once in my life found something that I felt so humble to be a part of and that was the absolute wealth you get and benefit you get from helping other people yeah, the that's power the, of it. yeah that's the gift in life because it's yeah. free yeah it's free exactly and people the thing is we're so driven by money and everything Gr greed I tell you what Forget COVID, forget anything. You know, the biggest virus on this planet is greed. You know what I mean? It's, it's, the, it's the cause of every war. It's the cause of everything. And really, we're so money-driven. We're so materialistic that we've lost the benefit of helping other people. We, even in a close-knit team, people can't help each other. They're competing against everyone. You know, and that's why we do, we do a lot of corporate work. 
and they say to us, how can we do this? You know, they're always looking outwards and we're like, oh, look inwards. Once you get your synergy, the synergy of your people working together and you drop that ego and you start working towards a, a, a joint focus goal, that will change your external productivity. Yeah. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? It's, but the thing is, the point I'm trying to make that that really made me understand the power of helping other people, especially when they're less fortunate. And we weren't being paid for that. You know, I funded that from my work in Iraq. All the money, you know, we, we, I funded the whole operation. So yeah. it wasn't because of money. It was, mm -hmm. yeah, but the, what it gave to me was the, the wealth it gave me was just fucking unbelievable. Yeah, the feel good factor. You help, when you help other people, not yeah. only are you helping them, but you're also helping yourself. You're feeding your soul, which is yeah. the key to life. But it is difficult because we're still all selfish fuckers. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? We can yeah. preach all this stuff and we still think we always want more. Yeah. I always want more. Yeah. You always want more. Yeah. We want to keep, we've kind of mm. know the tools and techniques what we're yeah. talking about yeah so we kind of know to the, the frequencies and the vibrations mm. that we think we were attracting it's powerful stuff and yeah you're living proof that it happens mm. the same as myself that just constantly believe i do affirmations every morning yeah just keep repeating to myself yeah. and if i believe it then i will attract it mm. and it's and it's working yeah but it's still a battle when you joined the marines at 18 why did you choose the marines i chose the marines because someone said it was the hardest you know what I mean? It was like, that's the hardest training. I wanted the hardest training. I also didn't want to trade. I wanted to be a soldier. I wanted to be in combat. I didn't want to learn how to fucking mend a, a vehicle in the military. I thought being in the military for me was being on the front line and fighting. You know what I mean? So that, it was either, I don't know why it was never the Paris because that was a similar kind of thing. But it was, for me, it was the Marines. So, and my, <clears throat> my grandfather was in the uh, army. But, you know, I was, it, it was just I wanted to be at the Marines. I think it was the people around me that influenced that at the time. How hard was the training at 18? I always say that that training for me to go from civilian as a young lad into the Royal Marines was harder than doing Special Forces selection. Because you go from Special Forces, I'm already a soldier. So that transition from soldier to Special Forces soldier was easier for me than going from a civilian, a young boy, to a, to a um, Royal Marine commando. Do you think a lot of kids at 18 should be there or do you think if they're running away and a lot of mental health a lot maybe already struggling because we know a lot of soldiers aren't mm. do a lot of homeless work back home the majority of the people on the street are mm. ex-military yeah ptsd that are struggling mm. but a lot of people are struggling now do you think there should be more mental health checks before you join yes 100 percent. do you know what i mean i've said this before and it's like this is always the problem they're looking at you can never, you need to go to source. Whenever there's a real problem, you need to go to the source of the problem. It's like when we rescued those kids in Thailand, we were going to the brothels in Thailand and doing these undercover investigations with hidden cameras and all that, trying to find these kids that were working in, in brothels as underage, you know, uh, prostitution, etc. We realized it wasn't working because they were already ingrained into that kind of lifestyle. You know what I mean? They were, they were already, you know, they hadn't all of a sudden had money, had mobile phone and all this kind of stuff. And also it was so corrupt. So what we ended up then going to the source of the problem. And that's the only way you can tackle anything. Cut the we went, the yeah, yeah, absolutely. We had to go into the foothills in Thailand and find the camps where they were being kept before they were brought into that world. And it's exactly the same as this situation. If you want to resolve the situation, it's not the back ends you need to deal with. It's the checks on the front ends. You know, it's when they start. I've said this time and time again, you know, they need to have some kind of um, a lot more checks when they when they actually join up. And, you know, even if it's not the fact they can't join, they should then be given a lot more support at the front end because it helps out at the back end. Yeah. But the thing is, that, I mean, the students got to be ready, ready though. You know, a lot of people say to me, it's, is, was the military, you know, cause of your PTSD? Or, and I say, I can't pinpoint that, you know what I mean? It's, it's not, not one particular event. I know I had this traumatic experience. I joined with a load of issues anyway. So I don't blame them. But the thing is, even if there were countermeasures there when I left, I'd have gone like, oh, fuck off, I'm not doing that. Because yeah. I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready to admit that I had a problem. It didn't come out, come out until years later. You know, it was only like a year ago, and at 49 years old, that I dealt, I dealt with the chimp. Yeah, that's a long time. But again, at least you're dealing with it. And you know yourself, PTSD, mental mm. health. People are struggling with mental health now in a lockdown, yeah. living in luxury yeah. so as difficult as human beings me personally we shouldn't be seeing death we shouldn't be seeing mm. pain misery mm. but again that's what we're conditioned for such a young age to get into that yeah. life and like these kids in asia mm. they're used to that they're, yeah. they're used to that at such young ages you would have been used mm. to seeing dead bodies and mm. and you think it's right but there's something deep inside within that you know 
that tells you there's a sicky feeling, even though myself, even I'm doing good things, there's still a sicky feeling that mm. something ain't fucking right, man. There's mm. something's not right on this earth, and I don't, I can't pinpoint it. Yeah. I don't know what it is. I don't know if I'll ever find it. But there's just something telling me that something ain't right. But like when you went, because I know you went to Northern Ireland for your first yeah. stint away, <clears> and <throat> you yeah. seen it was it a head rolling down the yeah, hill? Yeah, head rolling down the uh, yeah, the sergeant. Okay, the thing is, I, I joined, and you joined from this brochure. What age were you then? I was 18. I was 18. So straight into the firing line. That's a war zone, basically. Yeah. I was 19 when I actually went to Northern Ireland. But basically, that was, for me, it was like, that was reality. You know what I mean? Up until that point, I joined because of this... I, I saw people in uniform, and I thought it was so cool, you know, all the chicks are love, you know, all that stuff, yeah. you know, and that was, that was the draw card, do you know what yeah. I mean? I, I opened this brochure, and there's a bloke on, on a fucking windsurf, <laughs> you know, he's on leave, and he's, he's got his missus, yeah. she's blonde, she's fucking essence, <laughs> essence sat on the beach, uh-huh. waving at him, and, you know what I mean, the, the reality of it was, you know, the first day out of training, when I went to my unit, which was 4-5 commando in fucking Arbroath in Scotland, and I'm sat there on for Christmas Eve with a weapon, like, oh, what, this is shit. <laughs> and then shortly after that I then go to Northern Ireland my first tour you know what I mean and then you, you people call it a conflict but when people are trying to kill you I call it a war definitely you know I mean? regardless yeah. of what it is um, and you know we were called in um, I think it was the second no the first night we got there because we were taken over from the Coldstream Guards and there's a, there's a bigger price on, on for Royal Marines anyone with a Green Beret or a Red Beret there's a bigger price out there for you from you know as a hit mm-hmm. so the more you know they, they obviously up the ante to try and and get as, as many kills as they could they got the dates mixed up of doing the changeover so when they attacked this checkpoint they expected us to be there and we weren't there so the cold stream guards were still there we hadn't fully taken over we were just in country and we were qrf so it's quick reaction force straight on the helicopters when th- something major happens in that area south armagh and um, it was that night, the first night we got there, straight to the chopper, straight to um, straight to the checkpoint, and um, the whole place was a mess. And the sergeant got out, and he's like, he'd been to Falklands, he was probably done a few tours in Northern Ireland, and he like there was smoke, just crap everywhere. And you just like, as a kid, you're like, fucking eyes are massive, looking around. And then he kicked something on the floor, and it was like he says, we've got to see if we can find any more of these fuckers. And he looked down, it was a head in the helmet, and you're like. Fuck it now, and that was like that was that that was almost like I'm not saying that's the most traumatic event in the world, but for me at that time that was like a boy to a man in a fucking heartbeat. You know what I mean? That was the reality of fuck me. There's no beach. <laughs> there's no yeah. windsurfing there. Yeah. You know this is that's the reality. Of Do you have to adapt to that situation straight away? Is, is like? Do you think? Constantly, everything's a mindset though. That I've mm. always said the mind yeah. absorbs everything. Do you feel as if you get brainwashed for a young age to think that that is a normal way of living? Mm. I think I think at the end of the day, you don't. It's not like you you adapt. What happens to you straight away? Whether you, you know it's a subconscious thing, you've seen something like that, you've experienced it, it changes you in a heartbeat. Um, and it's not like a conscious effort. You know, all of a sudden that, that does change you. It's like you know, and that for me was like I had to grow up. And it was like you need to grow up. It wasn't something saying to me you need to grow up. You're you just a boy. It was something that happened. Survival yeah. mode, basically. Survival mode, you yeah. could have been that. Fucking yeah. head rolling and it's down like, the street. It's almost like this shit's serious mm-hmm. now. It's not. It's no longer a game. You know, it's no longer going out with the lads every Friday night yeah. and getting pissed. But and your mindset, though, going through the trauma for ten to eighteen, being locked down, was that not a turn on? But did that excite you that you were involved with conflict? Did that feel normal to you? No, I did. It did feel normal. To, it did because that's where I'd always wanted to be. So for me, being there was just like, although it was like a, it, it was a life-changing situation just in a heartbeat it was like i am now where i want to be you know it's like there was that element of excitement wow this shit is real yeah it felt that's, what I've been cha- that's what i've been yeah it felt more at home than it had been for mm-hmm. the last fucking eight years yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's nuts though how the mind the mind is such a powerful tool yeah. we, we still don't know what no. it's about how it functions no. we only know a very small percentage yeah. of it I'll watch a few YouTube videos and read a few books and I think I'm a fucking genius <laughs> but yeah there's so much more technology to but there is this and there's so much shit information out there as well yeah. but you know I, th- I think there's I mean this I, I look into that so much I do a lot of corporate talks and you know I've looked when I came back in 2011 you know and that was the um, 2014, sorry, it's 2011. I came back from Thailand. That whole operation had fallen apart, and so did I. Pressure cooker exploded, and that was when I 
started having suicidal thoughts. And I, I always say, look, I don't know if I'd have done anything about that, but the fact you're having suicidal thoughts is you, you've already gone too far. You know, and that in itself is the fact you've, you, you're fucking suffering from depression, you know, at the very least. So that for me was a turnaround point of fucking doing something about it. 2011, I started to get myself on a slow um, decline. Incline, you know, I started Bison. getting myself yeah. out of that bottomless pit. And the only way I could do that is by creating a goal. It was also, a, it was about cutting away drugs. It was about cutting away alcohol. I never, I never stopped doing it, but it was like limiting my exposure to it. You know, at one point that was dominating my life. I came back from Thailand and it was like drinking, anything, any, anything I could do to not face myself. Reality. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was, it was numbing out everything through drinking drugs. Um, and it was, it was that turnaround point. And then 2014, I came back and put myself into self-isolation in Cornwall, had a spare house. I didn't have a spare house, my family did. And it was three months of, of I changed the fucking person I was from day one to leaving there three months later. And I didn't even recognize myself. And that was through mind, body, nutrition. I, I, I had control of what was consuming this. So I didn't know uh, mainstream media uh, in any form, radio, TV, no newspapers. And that's something I still don't do to this day, particularly. Yeah, it's all negative bullshit. Well, it's negative bullshit. I didn't need that. I didn't need that distraction. You know, the one thing I needed to do at that point was focus on me. And I wanted to start a company called Breakpoint, which was really helping other people. But I couldn't do that unless I came from a, a place of solid foundation. You know, you, there's so many people out there trying to help other people and they're fucked. Yeah, they're the ones that <laughs> do need to help. Do you know what I mean? They're, you yeah. know what I mean? They're, they're, like, and there's a reason. I know it's like a cliche, but it's like... There's a reason when you get on an airplane, they say, in an emergency, make sure that you put your own gas mask on before you help anyone else. And that is how you should deal with stuff. You've got to make sure you're fixed. You come from somewhere that's... And so I had to focus on me for that three months. And that for me, you know, I had no money, no nothing. I wanted to start this company. It was all great. And that goal really scared the shit out of me. And every goal should do. You know what I mean? But I knew I could break it down. And yeah. I, the first thing I had to do was get control of myself. And that's what I did. And that, I didn't even know about the TV show then. How, when you said, I read something, I watched something that you says you were bait in Ireland back then. Yeah, what does that, that, mean? That, was, that was like a realisation. I, I, I no one else had this. It was just like, excuse me. I can remember I got up one morning. We'd been sleeping out in, in the rough, you know, sleeping out overnight, doing operations. And then that next morning, I can remember we, the ECM equipment, one of the guys used to have ECM and that used to basically pick up if there was like an explosive device anywhere. It used to jam the signal, yeah, or at least warn of a signal. And I can remember looking across, I don't know why it was at that moment, but I looked across and, and I won't name him just in case he's listening. <laughs> but I looked up the hill at him and his earpiece, you know, we relied on him to tell us, you know, to go to ground and not go any further. His earpiece was just swinging on, around. So he's just walking along, his earpiece is hanging off his ear, so he's not even got it. Lost you know him. what I mean? And, we're, and I was like, oh, what the fuck? And then at that point, I don't know why it was that point, but I sat there thinking, this, it was just like a, an epiphany. It was like, this is bullshit. I just realized at that point, all these operations, all these things that were asking us to do, they weren't, we weren't the focus of the mission. We were the bait. They were sending us into all these areas to get attacked because that's how they can do their intelligence and build the intelligence picture. And when people don't get attacked like the squad is, then they can't build that intelligence. You know, they need to go off, off, off the last incident. So I just, I just felt at that point, I thought, fucking, we are just bait for something to happen. They want some, they, they're putting us into this area, go and check this out, go and check that out. But what they really want to happen is that we get attacked. Yeah, so we're we just, we're just crazy bait. though, aren't that? Yeah. Well, did you, what was your mindset like then? Did you want to leave? All, I want to leave. And that was it for me. It was like, because I, I joined, and I, I can remember when I first went to the careers office in Derby. And again, brochure. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one of the things in the brochure was like the trades you can do in the Royal Marines. It's like not many, but you know, I just wanted to be a soldier. So the center of the book as it opened up was this expanse of blue. And there was a mini sub and there was a combat frogman swimming to the mini sub. And I was like, she said, what do you want to do if you ever actually get in and, and make it as a Royal Marine? And I, I want that. And she just laughed at me. And you know, she just looked at me and laughed. She went, everyone wants to do that. And that was the Special Forces, the SBS. But it's, it, it was that thing that, you know, so I joined 
not having a conscious decision saying I'm going to join the Royal Marines and now I'm going for the Special Forces, but that laid a seed of something at that point. And I always thought I wanted to go for, you know, Special Forces. But at that point, after getting to Northern Ireland, coming up with this epiphany that this is all a waste of time, then we came back from there, went on leave, and then we got called up for Operation Desert Storm. It's when I came back from there, I just lost all confidence. This dream that I had since I was 14 years old and said, I'm going to join the Royal Marines. It's going to be the best thing ever for me. And then getting there and then being so disillusioned Empty. knocked my confidence like you wouldn't believe. So at that point, I came back from Desert Storm and I was like, I started to lose it, all faith in it. You know, I started partying hard and everything. And, and I really had no motivation for the military. And it wasn't until I put my notice in to leave and everything... And um, I ended up bumping into my old um, uh, officer from, from Northern Ireland, Dunirac. And he says, oh, how are you doing? I says, oh, I'm leaving. It's not for me. And he's like, what? He says, I knew you. He says, he says I know you have what it, yeah. He said, I know you have what it takes to join the special forces. If you don't do it, you'll regret it for the rest of your life. And although I doubted myself massively, him saying that to me, fucking gave me all I needed that little bit of confidence to, to give it a go and those words you'll regret it for the rest of your life stuck with you massively but that's the thing about leadership you know he was like an amazing leader someone I looked up to and someone at that time I was feeling very lack of confidence a massive lack of confidence and that's how influential people can be to other people but you know again you know what it's like in life there's a lot of people out there they just you know and a lot a lot of time when a lot of the time when people doubt you it's because they doubt themselves yeah definitely yeah. you know what i mean but for him it was like if it wasn't for those words i would you know and every time i found it tough on selection special force selection it was those words you know? how do you think you'd have coming back from iraq and ireland to go back straight into civilization do you think you'd have really struggled possibly prison possibly dead overdose maybe if you never went to the special forces <sighs> I don't know. It's, it's, it's a really hard question. I mean, there's a lot of questions around, you know, I could look back on. It's like a lot of us been asked the question before. Do you think if you got attacked by the chimp, would you have made it in the special forces? If I'd have been attacked by the chimp, would I have joined the forces? Yeah, exactly. you know I mean, there's a lot mm -hmm. and there's, there's a lot of questions like that. But, you know, I'd like to say that I think, you know, when I was a kid and I was getting into a lot of trouble with police, I, I don't think that was me. That wasn't me. It's not like... I almost, that was a weird time in my life. It was, I had no consequence at that age. I didn't even know what I was doing was wrong, to be quite honest. Um, but, so I don't think I'd have been searching to, you know, I don't think I'd have, I'd have got in trouble again. I think I'd have found my way. Yeah. I think it would have taken a lot of time. Were you partying, drinking drugs in Iraq? What, as a, uh, in the military? Yeah. No, not in the military, but... Did you know what, what was the story you took Saddam Hussein's old Mercedes and... Yeah, well, that was when I was a contractor. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, because <laughs> I went back there years later. This is fucking hilarious. So, like, I was like, there as a kid, you know what I mean? Mm. I'm like, fucking... Absolutely, you think you fucking... You think you were grown up, don't you, when you're 18? You're yeah. like, yeah, I'm a man now. You know what I mean? And then I'm there years later after, after doing Special Forces... And all of a sudden, I'm in Saddam Hussein's villas. You know what I mean? We had his cars, for fuck's sake. We used to hire them out. So we bought all his cars. We used to hire them out into Baghdad. It was like Hertz car rental, but an armored Mercedes that used to be Saddam's. <laughs> it was, and it was a spin-out story. It's like, and, and then going to those parties, which was just mental. You know what I mean? You think you're going to like a country like that. You think, God, it's going to be so strict and blah, blah, blah. And you're like, every Thursday night was party night. You know, there's these parties kicking off all over Baghdad, all these contractors and everything. And that first night I was in that villa. Fucking, uh, it's, it blew my mind. You know, I'm there and the lads had been there for a couple, I just got into country, body armor on, you know, Weapons and everything. They said, oh, take your weapons, put them down there. You know, take your body arm, chill out. Look after the clients. We've got the clients there. And that's when we're, we're like, oh, the, the door flies open. Well, it doesn't fly open. The door opens. And all of a sudden, fucking women in burkas, you know, they are with their, you can just see their eyes. And they're coming. I'm like, fuck, where's my weapons? And they're like, no, no, chill out, chill out. 13, I was counting them coming through the door. 13 come in into this, like, sunken area, you know, this sort of... Um, lounge area we were around the outside and they took off these burkas and they just had all european porn gear on it was like and it was just alcohol drugs everything it was just absolutely sounds like my kind of party <laughs> 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 but it was, it was, it was, i was like what is this what's going on you know i was there as an 18 year old kid uh, 
you know what I mean? And now I'm there as a contractor and it was, it was, it was the Wild West, mate. Yeah. It was mental. There was money flying everywhere. Fucking million dollar pallets coming in every day by the Americans. The place was flooded with cash. Everyone's fighting for what they can get hold of. It was, it was just mental mm. days. How hard was that? Because obviously watching your videos and reading your books, mm. you, you've done the test for the... the special forces twice yeah this is all about the mindset this is the stuff that yeah. i love so you were yeah. so close to passing and then the second mm. time you had an injury but we'll go right through from the start of it the first time you've done it how intense was it is it six months yeah six months um six months and i always say it's the hardest thing i've ever chosen to do and that's um it's not the, the hardest thing i've done but i chose to do this you know what i mean and it was like but really, what happened is, because I joined the SBS, the first selection I did, I'm, I'm one of three people in the world to have done the old sp special boat service selection and the new SAS one, because they, they sort of amalgamated and it's all one selection now. So the first one was an SBS one. And um, I have to say, I'm, I'm sorry to anyone that's, that's offended, but the fucking, that was the hardest thing ever, ever I've ever done. Didn't know what was going on one day to the next, didn't sleep for days. And it was just absolutely, man, just thrashed, thrashed and thrashed, you know, in, in canoes, carrying canoes, digging canoes in the ground. It was just mental, you know, it's just under pressure all day long. And then, then we went off to the jungle. That's when you did, used to join uh, the SAS and do that joint selection process in the jungle. So six weeks in there, then you used to come out, do some skills training. The last thing you do is escape and evasion. And it was um, in the escape and evasion that we're escaping across Wales and, um, we had an altercation with a Welsh farmer. <laughs> and it's funny because I always wonder whether that bloke is listening, but we ended up going into a barn and you're not supposed to have any civilian contact whatsoever. Everyone cheats and it's just the name of the game, but don't get caught. And then we got a lift off the guy. Um, and then that now, you know, we were trying to get out of his car. We couldn't get out of the back and he's pissed out his face. He had his, his handyman was driving the car and, um, we managed, we were like, ah, Glenn, let us out, let us out. He said, oh, I'll let you out, lads. He, and we could hear him get out of the car, and then we heard this thud. And um, and then one of the lads managed to smack the doors open. We ran off, and then two days later, we're pulled in and given a field interrogation, and they knew exactly what had, what had been happening. And what had happened, the guy had fallen out of the car, smashed his head on the floor, gone to hospital and said that he'd been beaten up by the SAS. Yeah. And then we're off the course. Fucking oh, how, two days. Two days after six months. And how did that affect you then? Were you thinking game over? Home well, time? Mate, I mean, that for me, when I started selection, it was like, I'm going to go outside. I'm going to be a civilian. And it was that officer that changed my, you know. There's a lot of training, obviously. There was like a couple, of, a couple, three months of training to actually start. So it was a nine-month process. To get to the end then, and then be sent back. I was sent back to 4-5 Commando up in Scotland, Arbroath. And um, going back there, it was like I was, I was losing all fucking motivation whatsoever. And because, you know, that sort of furnace that was burning for, of passion to, to be a Special Forces soldier. And I've always been one of these people that focuses on the, on the, on the end result. I don't look at the journey. Yeah. You can't control the journey. But I felt it, I can always fall in love. It's something I've always been able to do. I still do it to this day. I actually experiences it experience that like i've already achieved it you know and add emotions to that and, and and make it very real and that's the one thing that pulls me through and i had that dream you know that dream of being a special forces soldier how that would change my whole life how that would make me feel how you know all kinds of stuff and and that was the one thing you know that fire was 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 just embers but then i got back to four five and it was going back there and it was actually hearing those words again in my head you'll regret it for the rest of your life and it was also almost like there's unfinished business i need something you know i got so far to the end that how could i just walk out so those embers that were still burning um i managed to recreate you know get them going again before i knew it was a, it was a it's a fucking a fire of of passion to achieve it again and and i was back on there and then the, the second time round was just fraught with fucking absolute. Was it harder the horrendous. second time because you know you were getting yourself into it, or was it easier? Easier. What was that? Yeah, it's easier because, like the I was then I then did the joint selection. Now the joint selection is, you know, every day that's what's going to happen. So I know what's going to happen tomorrow, the day after. When I did SBS selection, you don't know what's you don't you haven't got a clue what's going on. You know what I mean? So that knowing, being able to know that tomorrow is like a twenty k yomp. 
Uh, the day after that's going to be 30k then it's for you know whatever it is we knew we knew the path in front of us when you don't know the path in front of us it creates all kinds of self-doubt anxiety and all that kind of stuff but for me you know that doing that selection and going to the Brecon Beacons and doing their selection it would have gone fine if it wasn't for the fact I fucking near enough broke my leg or my ankle I tw my ankle did a 90 degree tw I could hear all the tendons going and, um, you know, at that point, they tried to take me off and said, look, you've, you're not going to pass. They said, if, if you fail a march because of that, you'll never be able to come back again because I'd already done it once. And they were like, I just, I just knew in my head that there was no way I was coming back. This was the last time. I wouldn't be coming back again. Has anybody ever come back for a third time? No, you just can't. You're not allowed. Oh, do you not? No. So it was either, now or never. Now or never. So for me, it was like I'm. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna sort of say, yeah, I'm coming off with a medical withdrawal. That means that wouldn't. You know, I could have had another go. I just know in my head that I didn't have it there to come back again. How long was the march? You had to do. Well, I mean, you do it days and days and days. So the first one, I think that was something like twenty k yomp. That first one was with packs you know weight weapons everything and that's when i went over my ankle and that that day i mean the, my ankle swelled up massively and uh but that night i just strapped it up took loads of proofing and um mate i was crying the next day through 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 the elam valley which is they call it baby's heads because it's just like the, the ground is so uneven it's like it's horrendous and i can remember crying all the way through that but i made the times I made the times and then slowly over that time, I, you know, I managed to do that every day and then the, my ankle started to get a bit stronger, 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 but it, it was fucking horrendous. How many people do these courses? Um, well, you're looking around about 260 and about five people pass every course. And you passed with your feet fucked as well. Yeah. So you get through yeah. this sort of intensity, did that, obviously you're battling with your mindset, does that make mm. your mind stronger or does it, or does it make it more kind of all over the place because of what you're putting yourself through. You know what, through. I, was, I was seeing people, it, it, it interested me, I was watching people that people want to find an excuse so they don't have to blame, that uh, the, they don't have, have to be seen that they haven't got the mental robustness to complete it because special forces selection, right, you have to be fit, yeah, but it's, it's really about being able to maintain being in a uh, state of discomfort for long, long periods of time. You know what I mean? You can get the fittest person in the world to come and do special forces selection, but there's such a level of discomfort. You chuck a pack on the back, you make sure they're cold for extended period of, periods of times and they'll just fall apart. So for me, it's just, and I could see so many people, you know, they come off with a little spray and, oh, that's me, I'm done. And I just saw these people thinking, fucking, yeah, that's just weak. I just knew that my, my leg was bust, you know, it was fucking so painful. And I was seeing people with little greys and a little limp and going, oh, no, no, it's not for me. I mean, you, your feet, are, are, you take your socks off and half your foot comes off with it every night. You know, the bliss isn't, so you, your feet are just raw. So each march, every march you do, you like, you have to get through about two hours of pain just to get over the pain barrier. You know, every day it's just horrendous pain. So, but you have to be able to put up with that yeah. to keep on going. But does that show you how far human beings can go when they actually put their yeah. mind to it? See the people who passed with you. Mm. Did you know they? Did you see something in them that they would pass, or, or did people surprise you? That like, no, I, no, I'm surprised yeah. with so many people that like, I yeah. see so many strong people mm. that become so weak, and yeah. you, you're surprised that people go, "Fuck me, you're really strong mentally." Yeah, did you? Was it a surprise to you who passed with you? No, it's not. I mean, it wasn't so much a surprise because it's, a, it's, it's an ongoing process where you can see people dropping by the wayside, but you can't predict it from day one. You can't say, well, he looks fit, so he's going to pass because mm -hmm. you don't know what's going on up here. You know what I mean? It's like the ones that shine through at the end, you know, you couldn't predict that. You can obviously, you know, fitness is one thing. You, if someone turns up and they're, they're not fit, then it's clear that, that fit, their physical ability is going to hold them back and they're not going to pass. But it's so hard to say that he's going to pass, he's going to pass. It's like watching the show on, on TV, you know, S.A. Sudez wins, everyone goes, oh, I thought he passed because he was really fit. And it's like that's got, that plays a small part. You know, it's, you've got to have so much mental strength to be able to carry on when, and try and draw that extra 40, 50, 60% when times get shit, you know, you've got to understand that we're wired to avoid any kind of stress, discomfort, and our minds will steer us away from anything that's going to cause us that, you know, yeah. so our minds are always looking for the easy way out, always, and it's about being able to, to beat that, 
it's about being yeah. able to beat that that's i mean i, I talk a, a lot about the psychology of everything you know it's i understood that that you know we are always looking for that um we're always looking to avoid the stress and discomfort and uh, any kind of shortcut we can take we will do so it's, it's i think when you understand how we work as humans it's like I always say, look at how a mechanic can't fix a car, can't fix a motorbike, any kind of machine until he understands how it works. It's no different to us. You know what I mean? No different to us humans. As soon as we understand what's going on up here and, and how to work with it, we learn to work with our weakness as well as our strengths. That helps us get through everything. Yeah. What happened then after you passed? Was it the SAS the second time? SAS, past the SAS selection. And what happened? What, what, what did you like? I life went go to my then? team. After I finished that, I went to my team and then. To me, that was like, it was almost like I'd done that challenge and straight away I was like... Unf I had no, unfulfilled again? Yeah. And I just couldn't find that, I couldn't find that sort of, um, everywhere I looked, it wasn't there. I couldn't find that, I couldn't feel fulfilled, I couldn't feel happy, I couldn't find any balance, anything. And it wasn't until I went over there to Thailand that I found that, you know, because after, after spending six years in the Special Forces and then coming out the back end of that, then going over to Iraq as a contractor, and again, I'm bouncing all over the world, I'm fucking trying to find this ex external fix that's not there. You know, and I'm getting, I'm drinking too much, and I'm doing this, I'm doing that, and everything's external. It wasn't until I did that operation with the kids, helping, uh, rescuing the kids in Thailand, that everything started to change when I started to understand. The thing is, I, I look back now, is we have to find purpose. It's all about purpose. But the thing is, you know, as a kid, you can't find purpose. You need to experience. So everything I was doing, I was bouncing around trying to find these, and then I stumbled across something that then I stumbled across my purpose. How did that come about with the kids in Asia? Because I know I think there's like over 2 million people, over mm. 2 million kids get trafficked yeah. in Asia alone yeah. each year, which yeah. is fun fucking it's crazy, crazy, crazy numbers. Yeah, crazy. So how did you end up getting into that path? Well, I came out of, I came out of um, Iraq and... Uh, I was like, I need to stay away from war zones. You know what I mean? It's, it, my mental health was absolutely fucking going downhill big time. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I was over in Iraq and I was, I was taking steroids at one point, Valium, um, drugs. Apples uh, and donors. Yeah, and alcohol heavily. And it was just like a cocktail of mayhem for my mental health. Came out of that and living in a war zone for, for six, you know, six years was horrendous. Um, I came out, I was living in Australia at that time and I was like, got into some property development and stuff like that and everything was going fine. But then I just started getting, again, I started getting bored and because I was getting bored and because I wasn't, couldn't find that sense of fulfillment, you know, that I could, could never find. I thought I had to go back to a war zone or, you know, I thought that's where, you know, that's where you guys go kind of thing. You know, ex-Special Forces soldiers. So anyway, something... I then got some information about an organisation called The Grey Man that was rescuing kids from child prostitution, slavery in Southeast Asia. Those numbers, um, which absolutely... You know, the thing that hit me the hardest was the fact these kids are sold into that lifestyle by their families. Now, I fucking moaned about not... In that book, I think I moaned about not getting a hug from my dad. You know what I mean? These kids are sold by their families and I couldn't get my head around that. So I wanted to have some kind of help in changing the destiny of their lives so an ex-commando that started this organization called the gray man was running operations in, over overseas and i got um introduced to him and then um ended up in in southeast asia running operations over there and um, we had such a good success rate it was going brilliantly i, I fi finally finally found what my purpose was feeling so happy i thought this is going to be uh, this will be me for the rest of my life and then um the whole thing fell apart, you know, the, where it was, it was in the papers all over the world about these bus we were doing, one particular bus, 22 kids. And then the US State Department got onto the Thai government and said, what the fuck is this? We give you millions of dollars every year. This four-man team that we've never seen or don't know where they're from have gone in and done more than you've ever done. What, what is going on? And then, so then the Thai government claimed that there was no such issue, nothing going on, and that we were a bogus charity putting money in our own pockets which we weren't because I was paying for it anyway, that operation from the money I earned in Iraq. So very quickly that thing turned on its arse and we had to escape out of Thailand. And, um, and that's when, you know, I ended up back in Australia and my whole life fell apart at that point. Was that when you started drinking and taking drugs? Well, I was doing that anyway. Yeah. You know what I, mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was doing that anyway, uh -huh. but I was, you know, I was like a functioning, I, I, I wouldn't even call it an addict. You know, it was, it was, dependency not addiction 
regardless of what it was, it was, it was abuse. You know what I mean? I was on this passive, yeah, passive self harm. So yeah, self harm. And so every time I wasn't working, I'd be either hitting the, you know, I I just called it partying, but it was just simply, you know, I was on this path of fucking distraction. Um, and um, and that, but when I came back, you know, it's different. It was different because everything had fallen apart. My life was falling apart. You know, I was drinking to 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 stop the noise in my head, stop the, you know. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't sit with myself sober. You know, the the reality of that was, I hated it, couldn't stand it. And th at that point, that's when my my you know my life fell apart. Part of that point, I realised I had to fucking do something yeah. about it. How hard was it being in the war zones for six years at a time? Yeah, that was hideous. But the thing is, you'd be drawn in because of the money. I mean, I earned more, more money there in one month than I did in a whole year in the military. So for me, I call it fool's gold now because. You know, it draws you there for the, for that. The dollar. And we're just drawn, you know, for me, I was like, everything was focused on cash, 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 cash. It was all about money. I wasn't paid much in the um, in the military. Um, and for me, it was all about cash. And that was the main focus. Everything was about cash. Um, so at that point, it was, it was like, when I actually managed to get over that, um, that was a turning point for me. It was like trying to create something the way it wasn't, the focus wasn't money. Yeah. You know, the focus was, was starting a business yeah, that helps other people. I've seen one of your videos, you visualize popping champagne, but you, while you're doing that, there was a truck trying to kill you. Yeah. You end up, how did you end up yeah. visualizing that? No, because what happened is we're in Baghdad. Mm -hmm. the opera, the, basically, we'd not been there long. We were in a fortune. And because the threat level had come down, the, the statue came down in Ferdoff Square of Saddam Hussein and everyone's going oh the war's over and everyone knows now the war had just begun and um, we knew that they, they were going to start because we were expensive like security we don't we don't make money for a company we allow it to survive when times are tough so as soon as they can they'll offload you know what I mean the last thing I wanted was that to be the, the manpower t to be decreased I was a team leader of a six man team so I ended up going out to I had to I put my name, he said, look, we've got a job on for you. I said, what is it? He says, you need to go and pick up the new ABC bureau chief from Jordan. We're in Baghdad. And um, I knew that the, one of his top line jobs coming in, the new guy coming in, um, was to assess the need for security, meaning our jobs would be gone. I was like thinking, fuck, I've just started earning decent money, really good money, you know, I don't want this to end. So all the way there, it was a 14 hour trip. I only had one, I could only take one person with me. 14 hour trip to go and collect this, this guy. There was no travel, uh, no flights because of surface to air missile threat. And all the way there, I'm sitting there thinking, I've always been a creative person. I can, I can dream big. I've always been a big dreamer. Always, I can create the image in my head and I fall in love with that. And um, all the way there, I'm thinking of all the words that I can say to him to change his mind. You know, what are the words? And I thought, there's no fucking words. There is no words. And then I started thinking, what, what could happen that will, that will change his mind? And then I thought, we need to get attacked. So now I'm driving there for 12 hours and all I've got is visions in my head about this attack, how it's going to happen, where it's going to be, how it's going to go down. I could smell the cordite from the bullets in the air. I was going into, I go into that much detail about it. So the cordite, the smell from the bullets, I could smell that. I was engaging all senses. You know what I mean? And then... In my head, I was like, oh, we had the attack, the, the attack happened. We got everyone out of there. We get back to Baghdad. We go into the compound. And, uh, you know, here I was welcome. Next thing, I, I'm tasting champagne. I could feel the bubbles going down the throat. And then we go up. And, then, and anyway, the, the contract, contract gets extended. So anyway, we get there to the hotel that night. I'm sat there with my number two. And I sat there at the bar. I thought, I better give him a fucking drink first. <laughs> I, said, I said, you know what needs to happen tomorrow? And he went, what? I said, we, we need to get attacked. And he just looked at me like I was a fucking maniac, like anyone would do. I said, no, no, no. I said, this is the only way that we're going to justify our value. And he's like, okay. So anyway, we, we got creative. We had another beer and we got creative and said, you know, how it would benefit our lives and everything. But I went into every detail with him. And it was about, you know, we're, we're going to be on the highway. We're going to get attacked by the militia, blah, blah, blah. It's going to be between Rim Ramadi and Fallujah. You know, and then we get, get back to the compound, the doors will swing open. And I explain the whole thing to him. And he's like, we're laughing again. Yeah, yeah, imagine that. So anyway, the next day, at that very point, I'd forgotten about this because I was so fucking tired. I was driving at the time. I was so tired. So, uh, and, and just thinking about staying awake. 
I can remember seeing a sign saying Rimardi. I passed a sign saying Rimardi, and as soon as I saw that sign, there was flashes in the, in the rearview mirror of a car coming up from the back. Anyway, that turned into a full-on attack by the militia onto us. And I could smell, as, as we're shooting at these guys at 130 k's an hour, we had three cars in front of us with all our people in, you know, that we were protecting. And we're doing a fucking attack. We're being attacked by the militia at 130 k's an hour. I've got like a car down to my left. I'm driving the vehicle. I've got a machine gun on my fucking arm. Blasting through my closed window at this car. I can sm- and as I'm in this attack, I can smell the cordite from the bullets. Everything. The whole thing happens. We fucking... Um, their car like crashes into the central reservation. We get out of there. And I'm sitting there like... The fucking wind's coming in the car because we've got no windows left. Ringing in our ears because they're all the fucking loud bangs. And I'm just sitting there thinking, what the fuck just happened? Because it was exactly to the point of everything, times everything that happened was exactly how I explained it the night before. And then just to make it even worse, as we got to the compound, the doors open, heroes welcome. And I can remember pulling up the car, opening the door, and I can remember hearing, it's almost like change out your pocket falling on the floor, on a stone floor. And I looked down, it was all the glass falling out of the car and the empty shell cases from the, from the, round, the rounds from the, from the shots. And as I looked up, a glass of champagne. And I'm like, fuck, this is just bizarre. I'm looking at my mate, he's looking at me like I'm a witch. <laughs> and I'm just, and this bubble's going down my throat and I'm thinking, this is fucking nuts. You know, it wasn't the attack that was more freaky, it was the fact that I'd explained everything. You had visualised that? Yeah. And then we get called up to the office, signed contract for another two years. And then from that point, I was like, oh my... F-. And that, cha- that that confirmed to me. It was almost for me, and people can laugh or you know, say it's a load of bollocks or whatever, I don't care. They're just missing out if they don't see the value in this. It was almost like the universe saying to me, we need to show this dark guy how this shit works. And that set in stone for me how visualisation, how powerful it is. And believe me, I don't think about getting attacked anymore. Uh, yeah, <laughs> if the power of visualization, because what everything in your life at that point you had attracted through yeah. visualization, visualization, being in war zones. Even if you're going to use the power of visualization, mm. you want it to be more safer yeah. and more productive and yeah. more positive. But you don't want yeah. anybody getting harmed. But everything that you're in, involved in your life or surrounding mm. you, you have fought it, you have yeah. created it in your mind. Exactly, which is powerful. And then it, that made me then look back in life, and I just realised that I got in the special forces because I was in love with the dream at the end. I created the visualization of passing, how it felt, how it felt to those around me. And even when I came back in 2011, when I wrote uh, all the contents about already, when I was sat in that house, every day I visualized, and it was, I visualized because of that attack in Iraq. So basically in that house, every day I visualized, I sat there, meditated, visualized, and I visualized about me and Foxy being on a stage in front of a massive audience where we could talk about our experiences. I thought about this company where we could have these corporate people coming in and we could put them through a mock style version of special forces selection. I did that every day, religiously, religiously. No TV, no media. And then all of a sudden when I think this shit doesn't work, I've been asking for a sign. Give me some, just give me something so I know I'm fucking not wasting my time. Give me something. And then it was getting to the point my family was saying, mate, you're going to need to find yourself a job. And I was like, no, 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 this is going to work. It's not a break point. My company, it's all going to work. But I started to doubt myself. You know, it was getting to that point where I was running out of money, everything. And then Foxy phones me up out of the blue and he says, um, you know that idea we've got? I'm going, yeah. Would you do that on telly if you had the chance? I'm like, of course I fucking would. He says, well, I'm here with the production company. Can you have a chat with them? Because they're interested. Mm. <laughs> that was the start of SAS Who Does Wins. And I was like, wins. holy fucking God. That was the audience. Did you, know, you leave <laughs> everything? So when you left the Special Forces, so when you're at elite level, do you have the power to push emergency buttons for, to send fucking aeroplanes and shit like yeah, that? Yeah, 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 absolutely. You've got, I mean, you've got so many assets as a Special Forces soldier. You've got... You know, when, whenever you get attacked or anything like that, you can call in an airstrike, you can call in naval gunfire from a ship out at sea, you've got people around you, you've got so many weapon systems and everything. That's why that attack for me in Baghdad was, it was in, in Iraq was ho- horrible because I was, I was like a boy, in a, I felt like a boy in a man's world. It was a horrible experience. It had no support elements, no nothing. And that's, that really, although that was a good thing that happened that day because of you know, what, it, what it meant to me in the bigger picture, I didn't think I'd come away from Iraq. Mm-hmm. Every day was like this. How many did you see over there? Loads? Oh, no, I wouldn't say loads, but the thing is we were getting attacked a lot. 
You know what I mean? We were living in a villa in the red zone. And it's just that constant threat. You know, when you were going out in a car, you, you know, we, we actually had a policy within the team that if, because the insurance was so shit, you know, we said that if, if we got into an attack, if there was an IED or something and we were blown up, if it looked like we were pretty fucked and we'd end up in a wheelchair, that we'd, we'd kill each other. We, you know what I mean? That, and that was policy in the team. And having that kind of... You can just understand having that kind of policy and that kind of mentality for, for that while you're living in a, you know, constantly in that war zone. That's not good for your mental health. Yeah. It's a horrible place to be in. Like that attack, although I talk about that, it, it, I fucking hated it. I hated every second of it. Do you get scared or do you just get used to the high levels of... What is it they call it in your body when you release yeah, cortisol? Cortisol levels. Yeah, of cool. I mean, I talk about that a lot, mate, because it's like you know what in that moment. You know, I, I, I use that experience a lot because that really makes people understand the power of breathing. You know what I mean? A lot of people just have forgotten how to breathe properly, and a lot of this stuff when your cortisol levels start to increase, and that happens when you get stressed. That's because your breathing becomes erratic. So what happens in that moment, that's your fight or flight or freeze yes. response. You know, and the, the, the one way to be able to resolve that is box breathing. You know, they teach it a lot. They've started teaching it in the US Navy SEALs, other countries. People in yoga will know all about yeah, that. Yeah, Wim Hof stuff. Yeah, and that just decre that, um, decreases cortisol. It allows you to have a mindset of clarity, not confusion. Our minds can only handle uh, five to nine bits of information at any one time. When we're stressed, that goes down to one to two. So really, it's about in those moments, it was almost like on that attack, I was starting to spin out. You know, I could see the militia coming up. Weapons came out of every window. The fucking bullets are starting to go over the car. I started to take on the responsibility of all those people in front of me, the guy behind me. And then I started coming up with these scenarios of me being, you know, pulled over at the side of the fucking motorway being, being executed. All those kind of things I had to get rid of. And it was almost like in that moment, I felt like I'd stopped breathing for, for the last minute. You know what I mean? It was only when I went, when the, when the bullets started firing, it almost snapped me out of that. And it was like, you need to deal with this. And I took a breath and it was like I'd not br breathed for, like I say, about a minute. And just taking that breath then created that clarity. So I really talk about that. And that's, that's just how, and people, the thing is, because society at the moment, people are living in a massive state of fear because they turn on the news in the morning. Straight away, it's mainstream media. Fear, 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 fear. People are walking around in that natural state on, on, a, on, a, on a constant basis. When you're in a state of fear or when you're immediately you're on a long-term basis, your pupils dilate. And you end up being only focused on the thing that's troubling you. So you don't see the outside world. And people are walking around in that state of fear at the moment. And really, if they f started to think about this stuff, think about box breathing, start to lower that cortisol, they'd have so much more clarity and get a bigger picture of what's going on. Yeah, breathing techniques is, I believe, the same breathing techniques we were talking about Wim Hof earlier. Yeah. Has breathing, te breathing techniques have been going here for hundreds of thousands mm. of years, but not breathing enough is not sending enough oxygen to the brain. Yeah. You'll get anxiety. This is where people tense up, face goes red. Mm. Just breathe through the pain and you will tend yeah. to see you can adapt to the situations. That's why the cold water exposure is good as well. Yeah. When you get into the cold water, yeah. first thing you want to do is leave. But if you actually breathe, the body adapts. Yeah. So much to it. Everything, this is all the stuff that's internal. Which is powerful. Do you get nightmares in that, Ollie? No. Nah. You're just kind it's of not, used to it? No, no, it's not. Not. I mean, the last six years have been amazing. The last seven years have been amazing. I, again, for me, it's like... One of the hardest things for me to do, and I think a lot of people have problems with this, is the fact that they... When it comes to having mental health issues, PTSD, whatever you want to call it, I, I call... When, you, when your, um, your sort of bar for life is below constantly below par on a daily basis you've got issues all right and, and the thing we end up doing is the fact when it comes to ptsd or whatever it is though we're always looking for some kind of checklist have i been in a war zone have I done this the military don't own ptsd the military don't own depression you know what i mean so the the the, the only check you need to make is do you wake up constantly feeling depressed do you live most days constantly feeling depressed you know Nine times out of ten, do you feel... I mean, that is... You're having issues, you need to deal with it. So you're not looking for these stereotypical things you think everyone that's got PTSD must wake up in sweats every night, reliving an incident that happened in the past. It's not necessarily mm -hmm. that. It doesn't yeah. have to be that. You know, you don't need to be checking on the check. You don't need to be comparing with other people that have had it worse than you. It's relative to the person. And it's, it's not based on any specific incident. 
You know, I, I just think a lot of time people are living in such a repeat cycle of yesterday, which is human trait, uh, which is linked to our survival, that that just in itself becomes depression. You know, that's, that's depression in itself, just yeah. living in that constant. And, and depression for me is when the mind's saying, you need to change your habit loop because this one's no longer serving yeah, you. Yeah. You need to change something, but we don't like to embrace change. Yeah. People don't just wake up depressed. It's been a, a long yeah. st- course over 5, 10, 20, 30 mm. years doing that cycle of the brain. Yeah. It will repeat 60, they say 60,000 thoughts plus a mm. day. So you've, you've, you've set, you've set in stone yeah. your subconscious mind to the way you think, to the way you feel. Mm. The only way to do that is to do something fucking different yeah. daily yeah. and condition yourself. And consistency is key to yeah. change of a better life, of yeah. a better feeling, but it is difficult, it is, yeah. but it can be fucking done. When mm. your career was coming to an end from the Special Forces, were you f- did you want to stay on or was it game over that you wanted no, to no, leave? No, no, mate. The thing is, this is, the, this is the thing that makes me laugh. Since the day I joined the military, I wanted to leave. So all the way through, <laughs> <laughs> so the, all the way through my career, I've had my noticing to leave 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 like even before i went for special forces selection i was actually leaving i had six months left and i managed to reverse that decision and sign back on but then even when i got into the special forces i had my noticing to leave all the way through i wanted to leave so and again that was just me not not understanding you know i didn't understand why i couldn't be happy you so know, how was, long all in were you there 11 years to <laughs> <laughs> repeat cycle oh, okay, you know what I mean we yeah. call these comfort zones why the uh-huh. fuck do they call them comfort mm-hmm. zones you know, but that's the thing when I look into the psychology because I was like that why do we keep repeating these habit loops when they serve as no purpose whatsoever and the thing is it's linked to evolution we want to keep on doing what we did yesterday and the day before that and the day before that because as far as our mind's concerned that's kept us alive until today it doesn't give a fuck if you're happy or sad whether it's a good situation or not it just knows by repeating what you did yesterday has kept you alive till today. Yeah. You know, there's a massive sort of one, there's one thing, there's human evolution here. And um, as far as evolution is concerned, survival of the species, it'd be happy if you sat in a corner and just fucking procreated all day long. Some people might be happy with that. But we were put on the earth to, to experience and to, you know, and to do great things. Evolution doesn't want you to go out and fucking go bungee jumping, does it? Evolution doesn't want you to go skydiving, go to war zones. It wants you to fucking stay safe and carry on the species. But, and that's where I see there's a massive sort of, we're, we're torn in the middle of that. You know what I mean? That's why we find it easy to be lazy. You know, I, I find it easy to be lazy and I hate it sometimes. I've not trained for two weeks and it's doing my head in at the moment. Because you know you should be doing it. I know I should be doing it. But the thing is, and I, this is what made me realise when in 2011 I came back and went, how did I pass the hardest selection in the fucking world? And now I'm at the lowest point in my life. How? How? You know, and I couldn't, and then I realized, you know, I started studying these things, human evolution, you know, and it would be happy if we just sat in the corner and did nothing. But, you know, there's that other side of us that wants to, to experience, wants to create, wants to do great things. And that is really sort of, you know, the reason I called yeah. that book Battle Ready. How did you get the courage then to leave after 11 years, after being so conditioned into that life, the way you mm. think and the way you train, the way you act? What was that moment, right? Enough's enough, I'm, I'm out of here. It was just a, it was just a second, you know, it, was, you it, feel just, the mindset, it just felt natural. Just yeah, yeah. I, I did a course. It was great because the last course I did, I went over to California, spent four months with the U S Navy SEALs. And I, I got to remember, I told you when I went into the careers office mm-hmm. with the brochure as a kid and there was a mini sub, the last thing I did was that and I, I trained to, to pilot that mini sub. And that, I did that over in California and I came back and then I came back and I was fully trained up as a, as a, a sub pilot, a mini sub pilot combat swimmer, mini sub pilot. And I came back and then I never got the position that I wanted to get. And I was like, ah, well, fuck you then. And I thought that was it. That was my sort of, that was the point where it felt natural for me to go, that's it, I'm gone. Was this at the height of your drinking drugs? No, 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 no. After it though? No, I mean, when I was in the, wasn't, when I was in the military, it wasn't a massive, you know, I was, I was drinking quite a lot. But the thing is when you're in the military, that's just the lifestyle, you know what I mean? It was, it was drinking. I was constantly working hard, but then you'd, I'd have a few day binges, you know, and it was actually the most controlled I've ever been was in the, in, was in the military. The bits outside of that was the, fucking, was the mayhem, you know, the bits leading up yeah. to joining the military, that was mayhem. And the bits afterwards, it was only in, you know, 2011 onwards where I managed to actually stabilize myself. That so what was that to. point then, 2011? What were you doing with your life then? Well, that's when I came back from Thailand. The whole operation had fallen apart. Did my, that affect you as well, knowing what was going on with kids? 
Yeah, it is massively because just before I went over to Thailand to do the operation, I went to see my son in the UK and I'd not seen him for eight years. And he was around about that age of the kids that we rescued. You know, it's, it's scary because we speak, we've had a lot of people on this podcast speaking about the abuse mm. of the kids and kids getting trafficked. Yeah. The thing is, people don't believe you. People no. don't believe it happens. People no. think it's a big cover up. People think you're talking shit. People yeah. think you're just trying to get numbers. This shit happens everywhere, not on just Thailand, steps. UK, yeah. round yeah. the corner in Glasgow, exactly. and everywhere. And people think that the governments, the papers, they cover all this shit up mm. and people think, oh, well, you. You're full of shit then, but that stuff goes on, man. No, yeah, it gets a lot worse than people can even comprehend. Yeah. They don't understand the mm -hmm. depth and the... It is, once you get into it, it's a rabbit hole of... Yeah. It's never going to be ending. So when you come back for that, then you knew you were doing the greater good with trying to help people. Mm. And then coming back, is that when things declined? Well, no, for me, 2011, it was, I was in that repeat habit loop. You know, so I was drinking every day. I was not achieving anything. You know, I was in that repeat habit loop of stuff. And it was at that point where I started realizing a lot of the stuff we do is all about goals. You've got to be goal driven. And it wasn't until I set a goal and drew a line in the sand, I wanted, I created a place where I wanted to be and not where I was. You know, a lot of the time people are stuck in that habit loop because they can't see outside of it. You know what I mean? People talk about mental health, but they're focused on the problem as opposed to the solution. So for me, it was a realization that if I wanted to get away from this repeat habit loop, I, w I needed to create the place where I wanted to be, where I saw myself being. And it was only when I did that I managed to stop pulling myself out of that, 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 that hole, that sort of one rung at a time. And then 2011 to 2014, my life started to improve slowly, but it happened. It was 2014 when I did that intense three-month boot camp, doing all the visualization, doing everything I'd learned. You know, I came back, I had no money, I had no nothing. And you spent everything? Well, uh, yeah, I spent everything. And then I had to put money into my business and, and stuff. You know, it was like I had no money whatsoever. I was 43 years old. And, I, and it was at that point, I, I couldn't get a credit card because I would not been in the UK for 10 years. Um, and it was at that point, it was like, well, I may as well give this visualization a go. I may as well give this, you know, putting a planning process. I drew a, I drew a circle around a CD and I made it into a clock. And I put the goal in the center, which was break point. And then at each one of the clock hands, I put, I put a thing I needed to achieve to get to the, to the goal in the center. And that, the first ones was like, reduce my drinking, you know, start doing exercise, da -da -da -da, start making plans. And it was, it was, I ticked every one of them and I finally got, bro got to break point. And that's where we are today. And now, Who Dares Wins, which is up one of the biggest shows on TV. Yeah. Everybody loved it. And then you get a celebrity one. How did that come about? What were you thinking then, being through hell, basically, involved in hell, to mm. then becoming on one of the biggest shows on Mate, TV that was that phenomenal. Time. It was just, you know, when I got that call from Foxy, like, do you want to be on the show? I just, I thought Foxy was down the pub. I thought, <laughs> <laughs> they're like, we're yeah. on the piss. He's just having a yeah. laugh. Um, and it, I'll never forget that phone call. You know, I was, I was there, I was like, it was just bizarre when I heard that. And then, um, I mean, that was the tool. That was the one thing that was, that was the tool I needed for exposure. And very much the TV, I'm very I'm very humbled to be have been a part of that. The UK, I'm not in the UK version anymore. Very humbled to have been a part of that. We've done some amazing things, but my focus has always been my business. It always will be. I'm not here to be a celebrity as such. I still um, find it difficult Weird. to embrace that word. But one thing it has done is it's created exposure, given me a voice, and it's allowed our business to flourish and allowed me to do that. Yeah. You know, so it's been amazing. It's been amazing. It's, it's been great to be a part of that. I'm now part of the uh, Australian show, which is phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. We're back out there in March to film. Is it good to get away and stuff now? Yeah, no, it's great. Mm -hmm. It's great to be with the lads as well. I love being with the lads because they all come from the same mindset and it's having that solution-based mindset that is phenomenal when you've got a group of people like that. And it's hard to find that. So you've got you, Aunt Foxy. Me, Aunt Foxy and Billy. And Billy. Yeah. How do you, when you was four together, you are very successful, you are kind of everywhere, mm. everybody knows who you are. Other people who you were in the forces with, how's their mindset and do you ever speak to the boys from the past of the... Yeah, no, 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 no. We speak to the lads and people from the past. Now, one thing I'll say, regardless of who you are, the haters will always hate. <laughs> you <know? laughs> yeah, I get it, mate. <laughs> Fuckers, you know what man. I mean? yeah. Yeah, that, that, when I see that, though, you know, when you see people like that, you just got to think, you know, I feel sorry for them. Cause How do they treat you? The majority of them are yeah. like, love it. Their kids watch what it. What a jealousy, though. Yeah, but the, the ones that don't like it, it's jealousy. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's just jealousy. But I then understand, you know, I don't let that shit bother me. You know, that's an internal problem for you, mate. 
that's fine. Mm -hmm. You know, at the end of the day, you know, the fact that we're getting people that are inspired by the books, inspired by, you know, then that's that's what I focus on. He's have had some career so far the mm. last few years is flourishing. It's, it's brilliant to see. It's, it's always mate, good yeah. to see people doing well. Yeah. But you'll tend to see other people who are doing well will thrive on that. Yeah. But the people who aren't doing so well, yeah. fucking hate it, man. Hate it. Every it's time, I, though, every time I level up, or you know, you level mm. up. It's a new wave of fucking hate, but the more <laughs> you, you do adapt to yeah, it, yeah, the pain, yeah. and you go, wait a minute. Yeah. You understand it's a reflection mm. of them, yeah. but the ego sometimes kicks in. You yeah, go, yeah, no, of course it does, yeah. yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's, um, yeah, it's a beautiful thing. So when you're going through all your transition, the first book, Breakpoint, I know it was your autobiography. Yeah. When you started writing that, that was it, I know we spoke about it earlier, but was it a feel-good factor that you know you were going to have a bestseller as well? No, not really. But I, I was so focused. I mean, when I actually, you know, with your life experience, you'll talk about a single entity, won't you? you say, this happened to me on this day, and, blah, blah, blah. and you talk about single entities of your life. But for me, when I actually wrote that, I actually sat back and went, fuck it. When you tell it all in one long story, mm -hmm. it's, it, for me, it was massively therapeutic. I mean, even before the TV show and everything, I was writing chapters of a possible book a long time ago. You know, I was writing down the monkey incident and all that kind of stuff. I'd already written them into chapters. So there was almost like the undercurrents of a book starting a long long time ago um but for me that i mean you know for, for it to be a bestseller i mean that's that's been phenomenal it's been mm -hmm. amazing mate you know it's like it's that is like, yeah, yeah, yeah yeah i mean that's enough on its own yeah <laughs> but it's, a, it's, it's the battle and the struggle that you've been through to get to where you are and yeah. understand that you're a very good speaker you've got a great energy and a great presence about mm. you we spoke earlier about ayahuasca. Mm. How do you feel about trying that? What, 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 were you, what was your mindset and when was this happen? You know what? I mean, I'm always, I'm always intrigued about how much potential we've got as humans. And I 100% believe that we have got a lot more than meets the eye, you know, potential wise. I think there's a lot of um, human potential that's been lost along uh, along the way and I, I, I think to a lot of degrees people don't want us to understand our true potential because they can't control that and for me like knowing that ayahuasca you know the history of ayahuasca and the fact that it's been used for centuries to expand the mind I mean it went off to Machu Picchu you know they, they talk about the fact that you know you think how the hell did they do that and apparently you know it all comes down to the fact that they'll be able to expand the mind through ayahuasca and, and similar kinds of plant medicine so that intrigues me straight away anyway. An ex-girlfriend of mine, she was a psychologist. She started to do a lot of work with DMT, with, with guys with PTSD. And she's the one that put me onto it. She went away and did it. She went, you need to do this. So when you're, when you're on the right vibration and you want, and you know, something comes into your mindset, something you want to do, it comes to you, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like for me, I, I started thinking about ayahuasca the next thing and get a message on Instagram from a organization <laughs> you know, I'm like, this is my life mm -hmm. honestly if i told some of the stories you know people are going now that's bollocks it's coincidence you know and that's one thing when these things happen to me now i just know that the opportunities are already lined up out there you've got to line yourself up and once you line yourself up it, they just fall into your lap so i started thinking about ayahuasca a charity called heroic hearts project in the usa messaged me on instagram because i'd liked a couple of their posts and he was like i'm in london and, and, in a couple of weeks do you want to meet up i was like yeah yeah absolutely met up with him and he said do you want to come to costa rica we've got some veterans and it was like that was it and uh off we went to to costa rica and it's you know it's just like such a, you could sit there going wow what a coincidence so i don't do that anymore i'm like it's not a coincidence it's a synchronicity yeah you're stealing your ship of your life happens, yeah. yeah and um man i went out there and you know i i, I we had a chat with the shame and you know you, you take the plant medicine for i think four or five i think we did four or five ceremonies i can't remember but you know it's like we went out there and um you see the shaman and it's like i want to you know you try and invent a reason why you want to what anything you want to resolve i came from a good place anyway so i couldn't sit there going oh i'm sick of this i'm sick of that you know i could have done that six years before but i couldn't do that anymore I'm, i was coming from a good place but i, I just sort of said well you know i'm it, the only thing that scares me is being the person I used to be. That's that's the only thing that ever scares me. Yeah, I know I wouldn't, but I, yeah. it does scare but you me. You never know what's around the yeah, corner. No, you don't. And I want to make sure that that red button is well out of reach. And that's the mm. only thing I said to the shaman. I, I said to him, look, I want to make sure that I don't, you know, I feel like if something happened, I could easily cross that line again. So I want to try and get rid of that forever. Mm. And then I mentioned to him, I says, oh, and I 
got this thing with the chimp. And that was just like, just like a side comment. He asked about it and he went, oh. Anyway, it was all about the chimp. <laughs> as soon yeah. as I took the plant medicine, you know, I was off, off, you know, on my journey. And before I knew it, I was there as a kid, you know, 10 years old, you know, with this chimp in front of me. And I was like, and then what happened is I, I, I felt in that journey, all right, I'm going to go through this. It's going to be horrendous. And then all of a sudden, you know, when the, when the chimp roared, when I heard the roar, straight away, everything switched. And then I started thinking about the chimp, what it meant to the chimp. You know, and I very much express myself as a victim in that whole scenario. So that's what we do, don't we? We like we always the victim. I I I moved into that chimp's enclosure. He didn't come looking for me that day. You know, I was in foreign foreign territory. You know, I was threatening its young. So I I, I then became the chimp. I actually went into the chimp and I started looking at me, looking at who was then stood over my child. I so I was looking at myself through the chimp's eyes. And I was standing over my baby, and I was a threat, a massive threat. And that, I didn't, I then went, I could feel myself like turning to this chimp. It sounds bizarre, but it was, it was, it was a crazy experience. But what that taught me, it took me out of being a victim. It made me part of the scenario as a whole. And it started making me believe or see, uh, feel so much compassion for the chimp as, a, as opposed to me being a victim. It was such a bizarre experience. So, um, and then that was the first journey. And then the second journey, again, it went back to the chimp, but then I became the boy. And it, I actually, that intimate trauma that we lock away as a, you know, that's just something we naturally do. It helped me un unravel everything. And at moments it was hideous, absolutely hideous, because I went through the full attack. And, um, but it helped me to really unravel that intimate trauma. To release it. Yeah, to release it. And if I hadn't done that, I wouldn't, I, you know, it, it was almost, I, I became at peace with the, with everything that happened that day. Forgiveness as well. Yeah, and, forgiveness, yeah. compassion. Um, and also one thing that really stuck with me is the fact that I then looked at it and it was like at one point I was, I was sat there, I was, when I was fighting the chimp, and I was 10, and then in my head I went, hold on, what would have happened if you stopped fighting? If you didn't fight, if you just lay down and allow what happened to happen. And um, it was at that point, this is another bit of the story, but I then died. I then went off to the spirit world and that was fucking phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. And then, then I was spirit and not person. It was just, it was a crazy experience. But when I came back, I then realized that I've been fighting for all my life. I've been fighting everything, my relationships, my work, everything. It was like, stop fighting, just stop fighting. Surrender. Yeah, surrender. Surrender, which is a hard thing for any military for person to accept. You know what I mean? Surrender is that word that you never hear, but you know, you have to surrender to yourself to really, to really help yourself. Mm -hmm. How do you look now from your mindset today to when it was 10 years ago? Oh, it's just worlds apart. Worlds apart. 10 years ago, it's just mass confusion, repeating the same cycles as yesterday, thinking you have got to look externally for this fix. You know, it's going to make you happy. It's not out there. It's, mm -hmm. it's internal. But once you start investing in yourself, starting taking care of your mental health, and I call mental health is how much you're prepared to invest in mental wealth. That's, for me, that's meditation. That's, you know, having a positive mindset, making sure the things that you consume, books, whatever it is, is positive. You know, once you start doing that, the return on investment is phenomenal. But I didn't know uh, that 10 years ago, I was in this state of confusion, not knowing what the fuck was going on, not knowing what my purpose was in life. And um, yeah, very different. Uh, very it's great different. that you're in a good place. So just going forward for the future now, Wally, what's the plans for you? Um, <clears throat> much more of the same, you know, the last five years in business, six years in business has been interesting. You know, we've bounced from left to right, you know, uh, but we've always maintained on our track, on our goal, and that is to achieve um, our company Breakpoint. Um, we've got our Battle Ready 360, which I run with Foxy, um, which is an app, um, a fitness app, um, and um, the motivational speaking we do a lot for corporates. For me, mate, I found my my method. My I found I found the model that works, and I just want to keep promoting that more and more. The same, more books. Yeah. and just keep doing that you know you've got to get to a point where I'm like let's try this let's try that and sometimes you've just got to consolidate mm -hmm. it and once you've found something that works stick to it stick to yeah, it and add to it add to it and yeah. add to it slowly it's like I came yeah. up this morning with a new idea and everyone's like that 
let's just fucking deal with what we've yeah. got. The moment. It's, it's so easy once you've got that creative mind and you, you know, you so much and, and before you know it, you, you, you yeah. spread yourself far it's too thin. Try train master yeah. whatever you're doing. Exactly. And then add to yeah. it. A lot of viewers who watch, I know battle with mental health and addictions. What advice would you give for them, Ollie, for a man who's lived it and, and really changed his mindset? I think for the first off, you have got to be totally, totally honest with yourself. You know, one thing you'll do when you're in a place of depression, when you, life's not great for you, you'll do the worst thing you can do and you'll start comparing to other people, people that are more fortunate. Then that starts to bring in a sense of jealousy and that is the wrong vibration to get anywhere. You really need to be honest with yourself where you're at and once you can do that, you then have the foundation to be able to understand how, you've got, how you're going to move forward. One thing you've got to do is understand the path you're going to take. You've got to choose a goal. You've got to have a goal that basically overwhelms your circumstances. Otherwise, you become a victim of them. You know what I mean? You will end up in that revolving cycle, that repeat cycle, if you've got nothing bigger pulling you through. So decide where you want to be, even if it is baby steps, and start making a process towards that. Switch off this because it's not serving you when, it's, when, it, when you're negatively, and we're all negatively wired. You've really got to set, draw a line in the sand. And when the negative, negativity flows, one thing I'll always take from the special forces is that process works. A to B to C gets you to D. And don't listen too much to that. Yeah. Where can people buy your books, Ollie? Amazon, all, all good bookstores. They're on audio books, mm. everything. So, yeah, you, you find it hard yeah. to. And also ollieolleton.co.uk. Website. Yeah. Ollie, listen, Man, for coming on today, brother. Honestly, it's been an absolute pleasure. Great guy, great story. And I look forward to seeing the rest of your journey Thanks, in life, buddy. brother. It's been great. God bless. Check out more of my podcasts on the right and be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.